to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it. We have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to A Well-Designed Business. If you're listening in real time, December of 2022, we are continuing with our Flashback Friday series. And this is when we take a look back at some of the episodes in the archives that I absolutely know hold valuable lessons to this day. Now, back in 2018, I was joined by Mikkel Welch, and we had a very eye-opening conversation. And I have to say, I think it's typical of us when we imagine what celebrities' lives are like, that we can fall into the trap of assuming that their life and their work were always glamorous and that they you know just tapped on the shoulder by fate. But Mikkel is living proof that you must work hard and push through challenges and you must stay on your vision of where you want for yourself. And you're going to hear that in this episode today. Mikkel Welch is a New York-based interior designer, television host, and also the principal of Mikkel Welch Designs. Mikkel has also worked as a set designer for the TV show, The Steve Harvey Show, back in 2012. In his work with The Steve Harvey Show, Mikkel created lavish green rooms for prominent guests, including First Lady Michelle Obama, Oprah Winfrey, Joan Rivers, Halle Berry, and Tyler Perry, to name just a few. That's a pretty darn impressive list of people there, right? Now, you might have also seen him more recently in Murder House Flip, which is in its second season and rep- and premiered on Roku this past August. You, you, If you know Mikkel now as who he shows up now, you might only know him as the celebrity designer. He's incredibly talented. Okay. That is without question. But I think if you haven't heard this interview before, you're going to understand, have a new level, I guess was what I want to say, a new level of appreciation for how he saw what he wanted and single-mindedly created it. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and air the show as it originally aired and then join me at the end for a new outro on this episode. Hey, Mikkel, thank you so much for joining me on A Well-Designed Business today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so this is fun. We were we actually met in person in the spring of 2017 when we did an event together at Ethan Allen at their flagship store yes. in Manhattan with none other than Barbara Vittieri, the designer Liberty, right? <laughs> yes, that was so much fun. It was kind of like off the cuff, and, you know, she... She likes the truth, and so we have to get bought for the truth. <laughs> exactly. No, exactly. And we had um, you and Cheryl Eisen and Manuela Moreira. I always say her name wrong. Sorry, Manuela. <laughs> um, all of you guys were panelists, and then we had a nice big audience there. We had a lot of designers yeah. come. And, and how gracious were the Ethan Allen people and staff? Wasn't that – didn't they really oh, do, like, A-list – Yes, they really laid it out. I mean, Did just they? from like the, the moment you arrived, I mean, the, the appetizers and the cocktails. I mean, it was just a beautiful event. It really beautiful. was. I mean, you know, look, we both go to a lot of events like this and anything any showroom or vendor does for you, of course, is pr- appreciated. Right. But that was yeah. I mean, they moved entire, you know, sections of their furniture out right. of the way. And, <laughs> you know, they had a A1 a- um, audio system there. and We were all mic'd up and it was I was just like and how about I mean like the big TV thing behind with all of our pictures oh, up there <laughs> that I think that was like the highlight it felt like I was on one of like a set that I would have designed oh, for I know. A talk show. 
<laughs> that was amazing. I I took a couple of snaps of that so I could send it to my mother at home. Like it felt. <laughs> well, and you're being modest because you're accustomed to all that stuff. I was the one who was a little gaga. I was like, wow, I'm feeling it now. <laughs> so it's, it's all. Fun. It's always fun every single time. It's yeah, it was fun. great. So, so, and it's funny because we said that we were going to get you on the show after that. And now, finally, almost yes. a year later, we finally have managed to do it. You're a busy man. And I'm so excited to really uh, pick apart your career because I have to say there's elements of your career that are similar to other designers that I've had the privilege of speaking with these last two years. But this whole one you know, like thread that goes through it, that so many things have come from it is amazing. So I'm just, I had said in the introduction that you had um, an interior design firm in Atlanta when you first started out and then you moved to New York City. And what I wanted to know was, I see once you move to New York City, you are a set designer for Jersey Licious, you're a set designer for the Steve Harvey show, and then you're the H on the HGTV Design Star season seven. And so my question is, Mikkel, when you moved here to New York from Atlanta, were you thinking, I'm moving to New York to be an interior designer and I want to get into TV and set design and that aspect of design, or were you just coming to start your business over in New York and uh, an opportunity happened and that was the path you went? How did it happen for you, Mikkel? Well, you know, I have to be very honest with you. Um, it was a bumpy constellation. Um, I can't <laughs> say it was it was a straight path. It was like connecting the dots and the stars. Um, honestly, um, 2007, I was living in Atlanta and I was actually very frustrated. And, you know, I graduated from college trying to figure out what to do with my life. And my mother told me that I needed to find my passion and that I would know what it is because it would be something that I'd be willing to do for free. Mm. And so at the time, you know, out of college, I don't know what that means. Like, honestly, I just want to pay my bills and my student loan. So, I don't want to do anything for free, Mom. I want to make exactly, a lot of money. <laughs> exactly. So long story short, um, you know, I ended up, like, going to work for Bloomingdale's of all places because I'm like, you know what? I like clothes. I'm going to try to figure out, you know, how to make this work until I, you know, decide what it is I really want to do. I have this, like, bachelor's degree in business, and it's like, what do you do with this? But mm. Um, on my lunch breaks, I always found myself in Creighton Barrel and Pottery Barn, and I had really had this Oprah like aha moment where it's like, you know what, you're making eleven dollars an hour, you can't afford any furniture, but you're always in these stores <laughs> on lunch break, and so you know, honestly, from there. Um, I ended up going to work for a furniture store called Storehouse Furniture, and um, I honestly, I'm gonna be, I'm just gonna be very honest. I was a horrible salesperson because <laughs> I'm like, if you want it or not, like I'm not gonna chase you around the store. But when I was there, um, the store manager took a liking to me, and she said, you know, you should take your business degree and you should actually go work in our logistics warehouse. And when I was in the logistics warehouse, I was in charge of like sending off all of the uh, promotional materials for like El Decor if they're doing a shoot. And as I'm working, I'm like, I don't want to just send off these materials, you know, for some designer to create. I want to actually create these rooms. Mm. And so I ended up going online. And, you know, this is 2007. Okay. And there was something called Craigslist. <laughs> and it was like this new phenomenon that was, you know, it was only in maybe like four or five cities at this point. But there was an ad for a gentleman who was looking for a design assistant. And I took a risk and a gamble. And I ended up um, interviewing, you know, for this job with him. Um, and I worked with him for a year. And in that moment, I honestly just learned how to operate a design business. What I found was that I actually had the chops to put the rooms together, but I needed, you know, the background on how to run a firm. Hmm. So I worked with him for a year and I decided, you know what, I think I should go off on my own. So I went on Craigslist myself and I would offer to redesign uh, clients' homes for free. Um, they had to pay for 
the furniture, but I would actually design the space for them. So um, that's how I be honestly began to, you know, build a portfolio and having a background in marketing actually helped me from a business perspective because I said, you know what, you know, these rooms are okay. I'm getting people who have budgets of like $5,000, which is not much, but how can I get someone with more disposable income? So I ended up um, thinking of, you know, my business in another manner. And I went onto a site um, that, you know, listed several special event auctions and I would donate my service to, let's say like Susan G. Coleman is having a big breast cancer gala. I would donate an hour consultation. And what would happen is once you perform that consultation, I would say 70% of the time it turns into a client. Mm. And my thought process, you know, honestly was if someone can afford to, you know, come to an auction and spend, you know, $15,000, you know, for a table and then bid on top of that, they actually have the income to. <laughs> they have a few so, coins. <laughs> they do. They do. So honestly, that's kind of how things happen. And so, um, you know, so now we're at 2007, 2008. Um, I was just not satisfied with just being in Atlanta. I had this huge idea of, you know, having an office in LA and New York and like living this whole sex in the city dream. <laughs> and, um, you know, I'll tell you the truth with this. Um, I put an ad out on Craigslist in New York, Miami, and LA. And I said, wherever I get the most hits from, that is the city I'm going to pack up and go. So honestly, it was like Russian roulette. Wow. Um, and you're still talking about the ad for, I will design the, the f yeah. for free, but you, okay. Whoa. Exactly. Exactly. And within, it was like maybe five hours, I had about seven hits in New York because everybody wants something free in New York. Um, <laughs> But <laughs> there was a company. It's so funny. All of these things were just starting off. Uh, WebMD had just kicked off their website, and they wanted me to design um, a rooftop gala that they were having. And so that was kind of like my cue to pack up things. And so I packed up, went to New York. I had a friend from college who let me crash on her sofa. And... Um, I ended up going, and I'm like, you got, if you're going to be in New York, you need a job. So, um, I ended up applying to work at the container store because I said, just, you know, have something until, you know, clients begin to come in. And, um, uh, when I got to New York, um, I honestly crashed and burned. New York is a different beast. <laughs> and, you know, it's, if you don't have like a, a, a reputable name in New York, you're just no one. Mm -hmm. And so um, I ended up having to work at the container store for about two years. Wow. And it wasn't glamorous. Like I worked at the container store in the stock room. So I was like unloading trucks from 8 p.m. until 2 a.m. in the morning, like in cold, freezing New York in the winter, wow. um, you know, unloading huge mer merchandise, um, you know, loads of of containers of, of plastic basically. Yeah. But, um, in that, at that job, I ended up, um, meeting a lady by the name of Jillian Browder who became my mentor. And she said, you know, I heard you want to break into interior design and I'm looking for an assistant. And so she introduced me to the world of show houses. And what she and I did were we were prop stylists other interior designers brought us in to stage and to, you know, get them photo shoot ready. And so it just introduced me to, you know, a whole new world of design where I'm going from these $5,000 budgets to, you know, it could be a, a, a $50,000, sure. you know, bathroom that we're now, you know, renovating. Um, so it was just a world of a difference. And I learned so much from her. I have to say, Mikkel, this is so far a remarkable story. And the reality is what's really funny about it is, is that there's so much of your story that I'm familiar with that's remarkable. And we haven't gotten to that part yet. <laughs> so I'm like, whoa. <laughs> so, yeah, but. You, you get into a rough 
the real rough part. That's it. That's it. So, but I want to go back and just sort of, you know, go back through it again with you because there's some good lessons in there. I mean, I don't know how valid Craigslist is 10 years later as a, a place to do this. And you may or may not have an opinion on that, but I just want to just say the, the grit there and the determination in order to get work. And the thing is, it, this is um, this is a dilemma that a lot of interior designers have expressed to me that they face, Mikkel, is that in the beginning, they're doing a lot of work that they're not getting paid their value for. And I think, you tell me your opinion on it, I think that there's a difference between doing what you did, where you made a decision that you would work for free in order to do the work, as opposed to a designer that in the beginning of their career does work and then through the process of that project, because they're not so business savvy, ends up working mostly for free, but it wasn't a choice. It was a job that they either didn't understand the parameters of, or the client ran them over and they didn't stand back and they end up in, you know, a typical thing that I hear a designer say is, I thought this was going to take me three hours to do. So far, it's taking me eight hours to do. I can't bill them anymore because I said to them this and I said to them that, and I get that I probably am part of the problem here, but I don't know what to do. And so it's a different, and then, then, and it usually ends with, but I guess it'll be good for my portfolio. And I, I, I'm just suggesting that there's not a lot different in that physically putting a room together for free or not for free, but the difference is in the way you feel about it. Do you agree? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm a, my whole thing is I think people need to get over themselves. <laughs> um, if you don't, I'm like, seriously, if you don't have the portfolio, like you have to shut up and you have to do it. There are a lot of things that I didn't want to necessarily have to do for free, even when I'm working like on television shows. You know, I work in an industry, you know, where currently I'm paid to work five days a week, but some days I have to work seven. Right. So I just, it's like, you need, you have to put things into perspective. And if you look at it as I'm working for free, then that's what it's going to be. But if you're looking at it as a building block, and it, and it has to be strategic. I'm not saying you should just go out and, you know, do everything for free, but you need to be strategic in what you are willing to do um, if it's going to benefit you at a later date. And I think, you know, that, that's the biggest thing. To me, it's a PR. It's a marketing expense. And until you can afford to, you know, have a publicist who's going to help you get those projects, you've got to do something. Mm -hmm. And so, again, I think you just have to be selective in that. I really think designers need to get over themselves. Right? And I think that's why I get a lot of opportunities because I was willing to do things in the beginning that help propel me. Not saying that, you know, that's something that I want to continue to practice where I will work for free. But honestly, as my story goes on, most of the things that I've gotten have stemmed from the fact that I went to someone and said, hey, can I apprentice under you? Can mm -hmm. I learn from you? Mm -hmm. Can I do this pro bono? People are more apt to let you in. Once you get in, then they'll keep hiring you. Mm -hmm. People need to get over well, and I think, you know, your your advice is well said, and I'll just rephrase it a little bit. I think what happens, I'm going to make an assumption, is that when you're younger in your design business and you are out there and you're frustrated because a two-hour fee turned into an eight-hour project and you're feeling taken advantage of, I think there right. is this feeling that I'm the only one that this is happening to and I must be doing something wrong and that's why it's happening to me. And it's really, Mikkel, conversations like yours where people who know you, know your work and can and already look up to you and go, oh, okay, so... It wasn't always easy for him, and it wasn't always, hey, you know, I'm, I'm a popped-out designer here, and I'm getting 500 in an hour. Aren't I amazing? Um, so right. I think that's what's great. I think it's great that you're willing to share it. And I hear with you what you're saying, that you need to get over yourself. But the bigger thing that I want to point out is what you're saying is, you, you know, when you make – a strategic decision. So you were saying, I'm going to do this room for free and it's going to contribute to my portfolio. I also love the idea 
of contributing to the charity events. It's funny because it came up in a Facebook group several months ago. And somebody was like, oh, you know, something, I don't know, remember what it was, but it was, somebody was poo-pooing it. And the, right. rea- you know, but the reality is, is that you're right. If you are working and working and uh, swimming in the lane with $5,000 budget rooms, it is the people at the charity events. And some, one of the guests on the show over the past couple of years actually mentioned that as a valid networking thing as well, the combination of volunteering for the charity where your high-end client is becoming useful to the charity as far as working on committees and then volunteering your services when the donations come along so i think that it's very smart and i also just like i said in the beginning of this it's sometimes it's just headset it's don't feel like I'm taking, getting taken advantage of. I'm making, creating an opportunity for myself to get a portfolio shot. And so, and that was my other question connected with that. In because you have the marketing background and you were consciously trading your time for experience and work, were you? You. It doesn't sound like you had the ability financially at that point to then professionally photograph those shots. Were you just taking the shot, the pictures with the best you could to your ability so that you would have something to show the next client? Yes. I mean, I think for me, it was just tapping into my resources. Um, and for me at that point, I had a friend who was breaking out into photography Mm. and, you know, he honestly came and shot the space for like 150, my space was for like $150. Like I didn't have much of anything. You know, at that point, honestly, I was couch surfing, um, you know, staying with a friend and I can't even really say couch surfing. Couch surfing makes it sound pretty. Um, (laughs) I had a friend who let me stay in his 300 square foot apartment in Harlem um, with uh, mice and roaches and all other types of things. And, you know, we stayed in that tiny apartment with my my dog, of all things. Like, yeah. it's just too many of us in this tiny apartment. But I think, um, you know, with, with donating, I didn't think you really have to be strategic, mm-hmm. um, just as a designer in general. Like, I look at when I did my first show house. Um, you know, show houses are a great way to showcase your talent. But what most people don't know is you're going to come out of about ten to $15,000 of your own money. Yes. And just to participate in this. And there's sometimes there's no payoff. Right. You don't know. It's a risk and a gamble. And I think that's no different when you're trying to build a portfolio and you don't have on paper or even not even paper portfolio wise. Um, you could be a great designer, but there are so many other great designers, mm-hmm. especially in New York alone. But if you don't have those spaces, Sometimes you do kind of have to take a back seat and say, you know what, I'm going to take this project on because I know in the end this is going to get me to where I need to be and I can look back on this and, you know, it'll be a great story. And mm-hmm. so that's honestly the way I look at it. I like it. And also with your friend who was a photographer, he was basically doing the same thing you were doing. He was investing in. Exactly. Yeah, yes, exactly. So it was a win-win for, for all three of you, really, the client, yourself, exactly. and your friend, the photographer. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now you, you know, New York wins because they have the most responses <laughs> on Craigslist. Nothing like Russian roulette yeah. with your life and career. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, when you come here, so now you're here, you do the WebMD design rooftop, you meet your friend, you meet this mentor, Julian Browder, and how, what happens with when it starts to become the set designing? Is this another opportunity that you see and you you play out in your mind the strategy of it is it a whim is it on purpose tell us about getting into set design all right so set design so in order to tell you about set design i have to tell you about when i left the container store okay okay so i am at the container store and i end up you know um working with some developers in Williamsburg and I'm remodeling, you know, these model homes and it's great. And I end up quitting the job because I felt like I was financially stable enough where I didn't have to work at the container store anymore. And after my fourth project, um, my contract got terminated. 
And I almost went into a state of depression for like three months because now, like, I don't have, you know, like a job. And I quit the container store and it's just like, well, what do you do? And now it's like ground zero. And I ended up having to go work for CB2, which is a division of Crate and Barrel. And while I worked at Crate and Barrel, um, I was on the sales floor, and I was just frustrated again because, like I told you, I'm not a great salesperson. <laughs> and it must have been my second year at Crate and Barrel. I'm on the sales floor, and there's a gentleman who comes in, and he has about eight people who come in the store behind him, and they're all grabbing pillows and bases, and everybody's just throwing things up on the counter. And so I'm like, okay, how do I figure out what he does because I need to be doing that so I can get from behind this counter, this cash wrap. So I stopped the gentleman and I'm like, you know, what do you do? And he's like, I'm a set designer. Um, I work for the show Dexter on Showtime and I'm based out of LA. We're just here in New York shooting a scene. And, you know, I said, well, I would love to, you know, learn what you do. And he's like, well, if you ever come to LA, I will, let you, you know, come in, um, PA is what they call it, um, PA for the day. So I'm crazy. So I go to my store manager and I'm like, listen, this guy is going to let me work for him. I need to transfer to the LA store so that I can go out there and like make a name for myself in television. (laughs) So, um, a month later, my boss made the transfer. Wow. Um, and it's just so funny how life happens. I ended up having a coworker who had lived in Atlanta and had moved back home to L.A. So she let me stay with she and her family um, on their couch bed. Um, you know, they were empty nesters, so they let me use their extra car. And I was working at CB2, again, making about $11 an hour, driving a big gas-guzzling Suburban, um, and I had to put all my money into gas because it, it was so expensive. But um, the first week I'm at CB2, uh, I'm calling the guy. He never picks up the phone. At I was all. just going to ask you, did you call him and confirm it before yeah. you moved? or did you... I, did, I did. Oh, I had set it up. But he initially he responded. But when I got there, he never picked up the phone. <gasps> And but it's okay. Actually, I'm glad he didn't. Wait, so he never um, did. He never does. He never, never picked up the phone. He Whoa. never picked up the phone. So I've come all the way from New York to LA. Uh, really didn't even have the money. Like a coworker of mine bought the plane ticket for me to get to um, LA. And when I get there, like I say, he doesn't pick up the phone. But I made it a point. I said, you know what? I'm here for a reason. And I am going to speak to anyone who looks like they are in the store shopping for someone other than themselves. So anybody who had a portfolio or a folder of any sort, I would stop and I would ask what you do. Well, you know, what do you do for a living? And, you know, can I shadow you for a day? And within that first week, I got um, a project with Teen Vogue magazine doing pop-up shops um, where they would do little pop-ups and, um, different malls in the Los Angeles area. Um, again, using these uh, using these as examples of how I build a portfolio, um, because now I'm getting set design experience. You know, I'm or merchandising, like I'm designing stores at this Gosh. point. Again, doing it pro bono, but I have that backing. If I can say now, I've done projects for Team Vogue. The very next week, there was a gentleman, same situation. He's returning. 30 pillows, and I'm like, okay, he's a designer. He does something. Nobody returns 30 pillows at one time. <laughs> so the guy ends up, uh, his name is Orlando Soria. He's a designer. Uh, and Orlando um, ended up um, hiring me as a PA on um, a show called Secrets of a Stylist, and it was Emily Henderson, who's a huge designer now. She has a line at Target. Um, She won HGTV Design Star. She had just won her show. And so I worked um, with her for about three months. And it wasn't like a glamorous job. Again, I'm not getting paid for this. Um, You know, I'm paid in my meals, and they pay me for, like, gas reimbursement. But I was working for free. Um, My job was to drive around in a U-Haul van uh, with this guy named Eddie, and we would pick up all of the – 
all of the furniture that she would use in her episodes. And I'm talking about like we would unload things at a U-Haul facility. And so I'm like hopping out of a truck and loading a truck. And he's trying to show me how to tie Boy Scout knots so that this furniture doesn't fly (laughs) in the truck. And so, but in that moment, I was learning about television and how to design for television. And, you know, it was one of those things that I did not take for granted. And yes, I did not get paid for it. But what I did get paid in um, was the value of, you know, of learning television. Wow. And so I did that for about three months. And during my third month, you know, obviously I'm still looking for a lucrative pay. <laughs> and I was still applying for, at this point now I'm applying for a set design job because I feel like, you know, one thing I learned was fake it till you make it. And I really believe if you have confidence, and you can go in there, you can sell yourself, and thank God I have a marketing t- degree. I can sell myself in that manner. Just don't ask me to sell furniture. Um, well, it's funny. I have to say, you've said three or four times you're not a good salesperson, and I actually wrote down while you're talking, he's full of crap. He's an excellent salesperson. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, I, I have to call him out like on this. <laughs> I don't like to sell. I, I'd rather sell myself. Um, but... <laughs> You know, it's just one of those funny things. I ended up getting a call back from the Style Network. Now, this was the scary part. So they're like, hey, you know, we are in New York. Um, Can you come in for an interview in two days for a set design job um, to be a set decorator? Now, I've never – I haven't been a set decorator, but in my head, I'm like, you know what? If you give me an hour in Google, I can figure it out. That's it. So – I, again, didn't have the resources to buy a plane ticket. I called my coworker, and I said, listen, I know I've only been here for three months, but I have an interview back in New York, and I promise you, if you get me another plane ticket back to New York, I will get the job, and I will pay you back. And so she she laughed at me. She bought the plane ticket to come back. Wow. I ended up getting the job um, with the Style Network to work on Jersey Licious. And that was a different experience. You know, I, I was thrown into like, honestly, I was like thrown to the wolf. Um, I will never forget my first project was to design what they call interview set. So that's when you're watching a reality show and you see all of the foreground and someone's just sitting in a chair talking. Well, I'm designing this set and I feel confident in everything that I picked. And so I set it up, and then the director, he's like, okay, well, what else do you have? And that's different because in interior design, typically whatever you set, is that's kind of it. Right. In television, you have to have options because the director might not like the chair that the person is sitting in. We need another pillow to boost the person up, or maybe these flowers that you have just aren't working with camera. So I learned in that moment you always have to be ready. But um, I, I worked on that show for a year. And when we got finished with the show, oh, let me just talk talk about that show first (laughs) so that people can really understand what I went through. So (laughs) You're not going to talk bad about Jersey now, are you? Oh, no, no, no. no, no, (laughs) I'm kidding. Not at all. Not not at all. But (laughs) while I was on the show, um, I mean, I'm not afraid to disclose what I was making at the time. I was making $700 a week. Wow. And for me, coming from someone who is making $11 an hour, $700 a week was consistent money. And in television, you get paid every Friday, so it's mm-hmm. lovely. <laughs> but you needed to have a car because the job was in New Jersey. Okay. So I told the producers, like, yes, I have a car. I would have to rent a car from JFK. I live in Harlem. So to go from Harlem to JFK on the train, because I can't afford a taxi at this point, uh, that would take me about an hour, hour and a half. And I had to rent that car every week. And I could only rent it weekly because that's all I could afford because every Friday when I get paid, I would buy, I would rent a new car. But I was renting that car for about $300 a week. So to be honest, I was only bringing home about four hundred dollars um, minus tax, you know, a week. But um, 
it was one of those things I felt like I needed to do. You know, it's one of those things we've all fudged on our resume at some point about some experience that you have, whether it's, you know, I, I'm the I'm the best at Photoshop, but you don't even really know how to do Photoshop. <laughs> but one of those things, like, I promised them I have a car, and it's like I had to live up to this, you know, what I promised. But they ended up finding out that I didn't have a car, so they gave me a production car at that point. But yeah. I say that, say that, I was really hungry for it. And I think if you're hungry enough for it, because I really think right now we're just in a day and age where people want everything quick. They want it fast. And I'm of the old school. Like you work hard Mm -hmm. and, Oh, and, and stop looking at things as, you know, I'm, I'm giving this away. And it's like, you're not giving anything away. You're gaining so much more. So, um, I worked on the show for a year learned as much as I could in set design. And at the end of the show, at the end of the season, I should say, my executive producer, she comes to me and she says, you know, I want to bring you back next season, but that there's like a three month uh, period that we have off. And she says, and I'm afraid that you are going to go and work on another show if I don't keep you. Mm. So she said, I want you to work in accounting because I know you have a business degree. Wow. (laughs) But I worked in accounting for three months um, in production, and it was actually the best thing I could have ever done because then I learned how much everyone made. So I knew what to do. (laughs) I came back the next season. So everything happens for a reason. Yeah, it's kind of like, no, uh, I need a little raise this time. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I I saw everything. It was just like, ooh, also, like, I also thought, well, maybe I don't want to be in front of the camera. I need to be behind the camera because that's where the real money is. (laughs) But but I just, I I learned the business aspect of, you know, television and how to negotiate rates. And so um, from there, we came back that second season and when we came back for the second season of Jersey Licious, a coworker came up to me and he said, you know what? I was on Craigslist and here's Craigslist again. He says there was a casting call for this show called Design Star, HGTV Design Star. I'm like, yeah, I've heard of that show. I, I love it. And he said, well, they're auditioning in New York. So that is when um, I decided, you know what? Let's just chance it. And, um, you know, they're asking you for headshots and I don't have headshots. So me and my roommate and I use roommate loosely because he was still letting me sleep on his sofa. Um, <laughs> at this time. Your landlord, you mean? Uh, yeah, exactly. My Your landlord. benefactor, actually. <laughs> yeah, exactly. My sponsor at this point. Um, we go outside on the suits in Harlem and we're taking photos and, you know, this is before the day of Instagram where you can really oh doctor a photo yes. up. So we had to, like, take photos and go on Photoshop and clean them up. And so we're making headshots. They actually turned out really nicely. Um, <laughs> but um, we created headshots on the soup in Harlem. And um, I packed up my portfolio and went down to that HGTV Design Star audition. And that was nerve-wracking. I can imagine. Um, Although everything you did, every single step of the way, you just, it is the nice uh, epitome, the nice expression of act as if, you know what I'm saying? Because there's a, there's a fine line in act as if, and it's a tough thing to express to somebody because if somebody doesn't have the inner fortitude to act as if, and you want to give them yeah. some passion. You want to give to give them some encouragement and some confidence to act as if. It's it's sometimes tough to describe. Well, don't act as if you actually know everything because that's absurd and that right. you're going to be f- right. you know uh, found out as a fraud. But so it's hard to know the line when you're trying to give encouragement to someone else. But in your own self, in your own head you sort of do know the line. It's like when you described when you went from running around in LA and picking up all of the furniture to be delivered to the sets. And then it was like, well, am I set director? Well, Google in an hour and I'll figure it out. It's like you had enough, you had a sprinkling of information, you had enough experience and expertise there and to then just, you know, push it through to the other. And it's the same thing with this. Now you get to this interview for Design Star and on one hand, you 
you're saying how frightened you were. But on the other hand, I keep marveling at how each new challenge that the each door, each opportunity, each challenge that you create in your life, you kind of just push through and do it through the fear. It's really, really remarkable. So, so what happens? So you go in there and you're like, oh my God, is there 19,000 oh, designers there? What do you, what is happening? Yeah. So I get to the audition. It's like on the upper east side, somewhere in like the seventies. And um, can't get much shishier than that, right? Just right, start with intimidation there. (laughs) Exactly. I'm like, okay, there'll be you know maybe a hundred you know people outside. I get to the audition, and this audition where there were about I would say two and a half blocks of people. (sighs) lined up to audition it was in a restaurant and it was oh my gosh there was oh god there were just like hundreds of thousands of us out there trying to audition because the thing is you know it wasn't just new york you know it was the new york area so you know if you lived in let's say philly or somewhere yeah exactly you're coming in for it (laughs) yeah people are coming in from all people from canada people are coming from all over wow and so i get inside of the audition and the casting agent is like basically on a bullhorn hollering at us saying, listen, you know, there's so many of you, you are only going to have two minutes with the casting producer. If they like you, they're going to ask you to come back. If not, try again next year. Whoa. So I'm nervous, you know, you know, there's so many people in line and everybody has their portfolios and everybody's talking about, you know, I've graduated from this design school and I've done this and that. And I'm just like, okay, well, you know, you can you can do this. So I go in, and it's my turn. So I go to sit down. Um, they take you in a group of 10 or so, and or maybe it's like, yeah, it's about 10 people, and they're like 10 casting agents, and everybody is filtered to a different one. And so the casting director is flipping through my portfolio. She's seeing all of this television work that I've done now, because keep in mind, at this point now, I've got that Teen Vogue project that I did for right. free. I've got the HGTV project that I did for free. Now I've got the Jersey Licious set design, as well as the projects that I've done with my residential where I donated my service for those special event auctions. Wow. So she's looking at this type of work that, you know, I've put together. And she says to me, you know, this is great. What I'm looking at is amazing. I've seen so many designers, but she said, what I'm looking at is the fact that you have a business degree and you do not, you didn't go to design school. And she says, how are you going to make that work on this competition? And I told her, I said, you know what, that is the one thing that I am most proud of. I said, of all the people that you're going to see today, you're not going to find anyone else who's done residential commercial and is a set decorator on a television show. You know, that's syndicated that comes out every week. And she says, you know what? I like your confidence, and I want to see you tomorrow. Oh, my goodness. And honestly, that's how it kind of started. Um, you know, so the audition process, they're calling you back every couple of weeks. And in that moment, um, I'm all about, you know, how I, I laughed about giving me a Google in an hour. So one of the things that I knew was that if I'm going to be on television, you know, you need to know how to host so I flew myself to L.A., and I took hosting class. No so, way. Yeah. There's a teacher. Her name is Marky Costello, and she, her grandfather was, like, from Abbott and Costello, and she does, like, all the big time celebrities from, you know, from the Kardashians on. If, you're on. if you've been on television, more than likely she has coached you. And I went to um, her boot camp. And, you know, I I studied under her for about two months, and I just really learned the art of how to deliver a message on camera, how to use a, how to, you know, speak in front of a green screen, use a teleprompter, um, and just how to interact when I'm on a panel. And that helped me a lot, because when I got to Design Star, that was one of my saving graces that I went to hosting class and the rest of the competitors hadn't so if you give me a line i can read it just tell me what you want me to say i can make things up on the whim I, i'm ready mm. um so it but again it was always preparing myself like right. if i'm going to take something if i don't know how to do it i'm going to research it mm-hmm. and so that's why i would say give me google in an hour and what that really just means is if i don't know how to do something 
I'm going, and I think it's, and, and I bring that up, especially like for as someone who's a self-taught designer, mm. you know, I didn't, you know, I was self-taught. So I had to go work under other designers who were designing these designer show houses. So I understand how to, you know, maneuver through the D and D building and, you know, these other high end showrooms because there's an art to it. You need to, you have to learn that. And so my, my job was just always to research because, you know, it's, it's very difficult when you're a self-taught designer, um, especially in New York, because you have so many people who are like, oh, you know, I designed for this person and that person. Well, my thing is I actually laugh because now most of the time I'm like, well, I've designed for, you know, people of the same caliber, if not higher. And I also get to do it on a television platform. And mm-hmm. so for me, that's, that's it's a huge win for me. It's like the underdog has yet won. <laughs> it's it's amazing story actually i mean i'm just sitting here just really like with my mouth open like and i keep thinking oh that's the most amazing thing and another thing happens and another opportunity another thing that you see is it's really something Mikkel. and i have one question in there it sounds like to me by the time you get to the interview for design star that like you said you had the teen vogue you had the jersey licious you had different things happening but it doesn't sound like there was a lot of paid work at that point, that most of the work was work that you figured out a way to, you know, give it away like on Craigslist or exchange it for a gift at a a charity auction or volunteer to be basically an intern, you know, the PA that you mentioned, the the title called PA. But at that point, there wasn't a a, whole... your body of work, most of it was not paid design work. Is that correct? Well, that that would be correct. That's amazing. Um, That's amazing. The main thing is I didn't, I didn't look at it like that. No, I no, no. I know you didn't. I know you didn't. You, yeah. A, a complete investment into my brand is what that was. Well, and the thing is, that's why I wanted to just make sure that that was reiterated because, you know, somebody else could have the same confidence and moxie and some of those same experiences, but a whole lot less of them. There would have, you know, it's a lesson for somebody who thinks, okay, that's the line in the sand. Enough with the free work. I'm going to, you know, I am only going to work for, for pay now. But, you know, we understood that you were at the container store in New York for almost two years, and then you are at CB2, it sounded like, for two years. You know, so you have done a lot of what, you know, we call the side hustle here. And sure. um, that's a pretty remarkable thing to have stayed with it for that long. And the chances that you've taken, okay, so I'm going to move to LA because this guy's going to let me work for free under him. Okay, I'm going to move back to New York because there's an audition for a show. And then also the 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 you must be a really good friend because your friends have no and I don't mean it like I don't mean it as I mean it for real because people don't do that people don't let you sleep on their sofa for weeks or months at a time people don't buy your plane tickets you know once not once but twice unless you're a deserving honest to goodness caring friend back I mean there's a lot happening here in in what you're talking about I'm seeing so many layers of your mama is something else. That's all I'm saying. She should be giving classes on raising kids. <laughs> she, she and my dad, they did, they did an excellent job. But, yeah. you know, I think a lot of my friends allow me these opportunities because, you know, so many people move to New York and L.A. and, all, and so many other cities with a hope and a dream. But I put the passion behind mm-hmm. it. And they saw me, you know, working 14, 15, 16 hours a day. And... I was putting the action behind it. So they were happy to assist me because they saw, you know, he is really out here trying to make this happen and he's determined. Right. It's not Um, a handout. You're not like, oh, you know, nothing's happening for me. Can I just, you know, have this? It's like you were working as hard and these were just little nudges that you needed to help and facilitate the hard work you were putting in. You were a good exactly. investment, is basically. <laughs> well, no, that, I appreciate. It. I have a lot of people. It takes a village and it takes a community and a team, mm-hmm. um, and that's the thing. Like everybody thinks, like you know, it's so easy. It happens overnight. It is ongoing, it's still evolving. Like I feel like if you come back to me in five years from now, I'll talk about you know my experiences that I'm having right now. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah, it's, you, you. It's, 
a different a different level um but right. there's still challenges even you know at this level even once you get on television there's a different set of challenges yes um, and you're adorable on television by the way i don't know I, I would imagine that most of our colleagues listening are ex- are exactly familiar with who you are and have seen you on television but i you you are you the camera loves you you're very charming yeah, you. and you are very easy breezy and uh, you really you're very good at it it's uh and is that i uh, it has to a lot of that has to be your innate personality but i I think it's very interesting that you also went to a class to learn how to be a host on television. I never ever imagined that there was a class like that. <laughs> yes, you know what? And again, that's just doing the homework. And I have to give my parents credit too. So I did have a little head start, if you will, but it was one of those things I didn't realize. So my mother uh, was actually a journalist, an on camera journalist. Um, in Detroit, Michigan, where I'm from. And oh. so she did the traffic and weather every morning on the radio show um, that we had locally in Detroit. And she also had a television show. So Excellent. I'm sure I picked up on some of that, right. you know, as a kid, I, did, I didn't know it. And my father was a disc jockey um, on the radio station as well. So it was kind of one of those things where when I look back on it, it made sense. Yes, um, it was sort of like, was, wait a minute, it's in my blood. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the funny thing is my mother, she, she'll she laugh about it now, but when I was going to, do, um, when I when I was attending the hosting classes, my mom is like, listen, I've worked in this industry, you know, for 30 years. I'm trying to tell you, you have it. But you don't want to hear that from your mother. <laughs> She's you like, know, wait a minute, you're so paying you're... for that. You, I already am a professional and can yeah. recognize that you have it. And what you don't have, come ask me, I'll tell you, right? <laughs> Exactly. And I'm like, no, this is not good enough. You're local. Like you do the Detroit local stuff. I need somebody in L.A. to like, you know, tell me the same thing that you end up just telling me. But um, <laughs> so, you know, but that, that helps coach me along. So, you know, with Design Star, you know, I get cast for the show. Um, I ended up coming in fourth place um, on the show, which I was extremely happy. With That's an accomplishment. My yeah. Oh, God. I mean, my, my main thing was working in television. I knew, you know, working, watching shows like American Idol, like Jennifer Hudson, you don't have to win. Like, you don't you have to win, be- right. Yep. Um, and so that was my thing is just to stay as relevant as possible. And after I came off of Design Star, um, my producer from Jersey Licious gives me a call back. And she says, hey, I know you didn't win the show, but I... Um, I want to offer you um, your job back because everyone else that we hired just doesn't have the same tenacity that you have and they just can't do it. <laughs> and so she says, you know, um, but we're taking on a new show. And she said, there's a comedian named Steve Harvey who we're going to be working with and it's going to require you to move to Chicago. So I'm like, oh, my gosh, like, I love New York. I'm on television now, and I don't want to pack up and go to Chicago. I'm like, I don't, I just, like, I just don't want to do it. But I ended up packing things up, moving to Chicago. And my very first day that I arrived in the studio, Steve Harvey's business partner pulls me to the side, and he says, um, hey, I saw you on HGTV Design Star, which, by the way, I just like to point out, was not a paid program, so you did not get paid to go on these TV shows. So, again, this is investing in your brand. That's it. So he says, I saw you on the show, and um, I remember you. And he's like, you put that horrible green paint on the walls, and they sent you home. And I'm like, really? Like, this is what you want to talk about (laughs) in front of 20 other people? Like... And I'm like, okay, whatever. And so he's like, well, I want you to come and meet me. It was horrible. Like we, had, like, I just love you. Like really, this is what you want to talk yes. about? <laughs> yes, this is, this is like we're like this big board. Like you gotta imagine, imagine we're in a boardroom meeting. Yeah. There are like all the new producers. Like everybody's like introducing themselves, talking about new concepts. And he's just like, I've been looking across this room trying to like figure out who you are, and I know. You're the guy who got sent home, and everybody's kind of looking at me like, okay, like, oh okay, God. he's horrible. And so it was just embarrassing at that moment. However, he says to me, I want you to come see me after the meeting. 
So he marches me into the room with Steve Harvey, and he says, hey, you know, when you meet Steve Harvey, uh, he's going to take Family Feud this week, and when he comes back, uh, we would like for you to have designed his office. Wow. So I'm just like, okay, you know what? This is why God sent me to Chicago. I just need to design this office, and then I can go back to New York. I, really do not want to <laughs> I can write my ticket back. <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm like, this is why I'm supposed to be here. So I can buy my I own design. plane ticket this time, too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, now I can afford to buy my own plane ticket because I'm working. So um, I designed the space. And Steve Harvey, you know, I had to meet him at five o'clock in the morning before he started his radio show. Mm. And he asked his whole entourage, like his bodyguards, his assistant, he told everyone to wait outside of the room. And he just wanted the two of us to come into the space so that I could walk him through what I did. So I walked through Steve Harvey through his office and he's just like his mouth is dropped at this point. And he's like, I don't know how you designed this space within a week. I didn't give you any direction. His only direction was to make the space look masculine and smoky. That's all he said. Whoa. And he said, you know, you captured who I was within a week. And I know that was extremely hard. And um, something came over me in that moment. And I said, you know what? Uh, something's telling me to tell you I don't want to work for you. What? And in that moment, yes. Yeah. And in that moment, I promise you that was not me talking. It was an outer body experience. Now, after I said those words, then it was me. But it was just like something came over me. And I'm like, oh, my God, what the heck did I just say to Steve Harvey? And he said, excuse me? And I said, listen, what I'm trying to say is I'm not enamored by who you are. Um, you know, honestly, I am an interior designer. I kind of fell into set design. And... I don't want to work behind the scenes. I want to be on television. I want my own television show. And he says, you know what, young man, no one has ever spoke to me like that before, but because you had, I'm going to, I'm going to use a nice word for the <laughs> podcast, but, he said, but because you had the courage <laughs> uh, to, to say that I'm going to put you on television and the very first episode next week, that following week, was for me to give a walkthrough of his office. Oh, my goodness. I, I and, It's amazing. I mean, and, and Luann is so crazy. Like, that's why I, all of these things, I don't want to say they just happened, but it was like preparation. It was like all of these things that I had kind of prepared for along the way and I yes. didn't know. Well, I say that all the time, Mikel, on the show, that you prepare so that you can get lucky. That's the thing. Yeah. You you do all the due diligence all along your life, whether it's from when you're a child and going to school and do, being your job as a student and as an athlete and as a musician, whatever your jobs are as children, going through to your college and your careers after that, you have to do everything to your the best that you can do it so that one day right. it'll look like you were lucky. You know, it'll exactly. just feel like you were lucky, but because you had worked so hard to get where you were and you had done so many things that positioned you so well for the next opportunity, when this came, you, like you said, you just knew that, okay, this is great and that's awesome and you're Steve Harvey and all of that is really something else, but I'm supposed to be in front of that camera and I know it. That's amazing. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, it, was, it was very amazing. It, it worked out, but it could have went really south. Well, but the um, thing is, it sounded like you were prepared for it to go. That's the whole point of that moment. You see, yeah. that is the crux of that moment. You weren't doing to bluff it out. You weren't doing it as a negotiation. You were doing it is because it was real for you. And if he had said, whatever, dude, pack it up and get out of here then, yeah. you would have and you would have said, yeah. okay, next opportunity. Well, I'm waiting for it. Let's see if I can create it exactly that is exactly. the power of a the, the best negotiation is when you really are very clear on what you want because then when you ask for it if you get it it's a win and if you don't get it it doesn't matter because you knew what you wanted <laughs> I love right. it I love it oh my <laughs> goodness I love it and I have to say it sounds like a lifetime drama movie right now it like, does it totally it. does <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's like it God. We have to long, we have long. to get all these TV connections of yours to make a movie of your life. <laughs> I know, right? 
It's something else. And I have to just say, like, I just have to geek out a little bit. I love Steve Harvey. I just think he is a riot. I just, I look at his face, I laugh. Every show he does, Family Feud, that kid show he had. I mean, I just, I, his talk you show. He is a great guy. I just think about all of the opportunities that he's given me. And a lot of them, I know, like, if, I, guess I will be the first to say I annoyed Steve Harvey every chance I got. <laughs> if I wanted to, I remember once I, I wanted to do design seminars. And so I'm like, I don't have a way to, you know, promote the seminar. So I would knock on his office. Like as soon as he comes off of the stage, I'm like, you know, we call him Mr. Harvey. Mr. Harvey, you know, can you promote my design seminars? And he's like, oh my gosh, Mikhail, if you ask me to do one more thing every day, I needed him to do something. He would complain about it, but he would do it. Um, but no, he is, he's a very, very genuine person. And, you know, I will never forget one of the things I ask him, um, Open House NYC, uh, you know, they film kind of like Lifestyle of the Rich and Famous, you know, style where they do the tours of the home right. on NYC. And so um, they contacted me. And you know what's so funny? I got that contact because my coworker from Jersey Licious ended up being a producer. Isn't and it's funny? just like how life just brings right. us up around. He's like, hey, I saw your episode on Steve Harvey. Can we come out and shoot with you? I asked Steve Harvey, it was like three months in advance if I could do it. And then the day of, he totally forgets. Uh oh. And. And I'm like, can you do this? He's like getting ready to fly out of the country on vacation. And he stopped what he was doing. And he's like, you know what? I would not do this for anyone else because he's not getting paid to go on camera. Right. So he's like, you know, because it's for you and your brand, I will do it. Isn't that something? So I'm a huge fan of Steve Harvey. Anything I've ever asked him for um, career-wise, if it's, within reason actually even if it's not within reason, <laughs> right fine. well and, and I love hearing that because I you know we all have people that we like and we admire from afar for their body of work and it's always nice when you find out through you know firsthand interaction or other people like yourself that the person that you imagine to be the person is the person it's 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 pretty cool oh, yeah. yeah and you know The one thing he told me, he said, you know, the reason I support your brand, he said, you know, so many people want to work for me because I am Steve Harvey and they just want to be under my spotlight. But you made that very clear that that's not what you want. And he said, you know, people ask me for money. He said, you've never asked me for money. Mm. You only ask me, you know, for a platform. And so he said, I have to commend someone who basically pulls themselves up from their bootstraps and takes a small opportunity. Because he told me when before, you know, I left the show, he said, look at what you've done. Mm -hmm. You know, you've taken one remodel of a room into being the voice of design for our show. Wow. And, you know, I hired a publicist and, you know, and he's just like, you've done all of these things off of one little small thing that you were given. And he said, yes, you, you know, you've used my name, but you've done all the work. He said, I just stand there. So that's a lot of the reason why, you know, Steve Harvey helped me because I kind of helped myself. Right. Well, he respects you. It's it's what I'm hearing. Yeah. He respects. It's the same as all the other situations. It's the same as your friend giving you the money for the plane ticket and the other friend letting you stay on the sofa because they respect your work ethic and they know that you're a good investment. I mean, I, I I'm saying it. It's like it's as if you were a you know racehorse or something. But it's the it's the truth. I mean, you're somebody that it's very clear that you not only work hard but you work smart. You see, it's not always about working hard. It's working smart. And that's what you've done. And um, it's you've really I even just there, you just mentioned how once you started working with him and you were the on camera designer that you hired a publicist so that you parlayed that you you continue to prepare to get lucky. Who knows if you keep you know putting this out there, what else will come from it? And of course, here we are these couple of years later and other things have come from it. It's really, really something. I love it. I love it. And I, it had to be a, a gas working with him. I'm sure. I mean, look, he's a real person and has tough days, but yeah. I have the secret <laughs> desire no. to be a game show host. So I just am like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Steve Harvey is so opposite of what you see in terms of personality. Really? Uh, when that camera is off, he's very quiet. Oh, isn't that something? And he speaks very low. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's interesting. He's still funny, 
but he's not a very loud person. He doesn't like conversation. Oh, so maybe like I he... won't make it as a game show host because I'm really, I'm even actually on the show, I'm the, this, on the podcast, I'm the quietest of I am on my whole day. <laughs> you know, you know, this talks to different folks, but yeah, he's very quiet. And you get him like off of that stage. He's so opposite. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. So one more thing I would love for you to just talk yeah. about before I let you go. I'm taking a lot of your time, but yeah. one of the things is that you now are one of, and I know there's story in between what just happened and where we're going to go, but bring us right to what you're doing now. You are a brand ambassador for Inspired Closets. Tell us what that is, what that means. And, you know, this is one of the reasons you know, I have to say to all of our my my listeners, this sound is probably just not quite as good as our sound usually is on the show. But you are in Idaho, in the middle of a hotel room, and I'm in the middle of a snowstorm in New Jersey. But I wasn't passing up the opportunity to have you on the show. <laughs> so, but tell us about Inspired Closets and what what your new opportunity is that you're doing there, Mikkel. Sure. So, um, Inspired Closets. Um... They are a retailer that sells custom closets um, as well as like custom pantries and offices. Um, they basically do it all. Well, with Inspired Closets, I am I have a contract to first remodel 42 uh, store locations. So I am in a different city every week. I'm in Boise, Idaho this week. Last week it was Alaska. The week before it was uh, Hawaii. So every week I'm uh, re. I'm, you know, going to a new city. And then on top of that, I'm a brand ambassador for the brand. Um, so Inspired Closets partnered up with HGTV uh, for their big dream home that they did in January. And so with me being a part of HGTV, um, I'm now a spokesperson for the brand. And uh, I've become a brand ambassador for Inspired Closets. So they'll send me to you know, various uh, store locations um, to, you know, give a talk on design and, and speak to, you know, other um, interior designers just about the brand and what we do. So that um, project, you know, I've been working on since July, and I'm going to tell you a very funny story about yeah. Inspired Closet. So, uh, so the Steve Harvey show actually relocated from Chicago to Los Angeles and they changed format where it's now, you know, mostly just a comedy show. Mm. Well, at that point, you know, I decided to break off um, because I'm not a comedian. (laughs) So um, my creative director from the Steve Harvey show, um, she called me and said, Hey, you know, um, there, I, I have a gig that I can't, you know, go to, would you mind coming to, stage um, or do a commercial shoot for this company called Inspired Closet. And that one commercial shoot turned into me designing 42 stores and becoming a brand ambassador. So my, goodness. my life is, <laughs> it's amazing. It's not like, it's like it's peachy, but it's like, I just take these risks and these leaps and they just kind of happen. It just happens. It's like, I, truth. I can't just. Well, it's what you said. It's it, you're willing to take the risk and the leap, and you always do the hard work in between. It's like it, it's almost like you see the risk, you have to make the leap. But before you take that leap, you're there. Whether it's in a boot camp for hosting classes, or it's googling this, or it's researching that, it's it's you're taking the leap with half or three quarters of what you need in order to be sure that you stick the landing, but you you don't worry about not having the hundred percent. You get as much information as you can and you do it. I am in awe. I love your story. I definitely think they should make a movie out of you. <laughs> the way I approach my career is I don't like to live in the what if. Mm-hmm. I am a firm believer in wherever you are at in life, you can always come back to it. What you cannot come back to are missed opportunities. So I am willing to take that leap because, you know, if if something doesn't go right, I can always go back to what I was doing before. Mm-hmm. But what you you don't get those missed opportunities, like those opportunities that come about where if you don't pounce on it, like those one in a lifetime opportunities, you have to you have to be willing to take those risks. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm a big risk taker. And I think, you know, most designers, you know, we're risk takers in general. It's just, you know, we when it comes time to 
think about our business, you know, and our nest egg, that's a scary thing. And, you know, I will say I, I do have a slight advantage over the fact that, you know, I don't have a spouse. I don't have kids. And so I can pack up and I can Right. It gives you a little bit more flexibility. Absolutely. Yeah. So it, it, so and I, and I don't take that for granted because I do recognize that. But I also say, you know, I took advantage of a lot of these opportunities at a younger age, you right. know, when people... You know, just I, I think I do a lot of things that most people wouldn't feel comfortable with. You know, oh, I, I'm, I definitely, <laughs> yes, yeah, crisscrossing the, the country, world. putting a Craigslist yeah. ad in, and seeing who <laughs> answers the most. <laughs> yeah, it's tough, and like try managing this with. I still have my residential clients, and yeah. you know, so I, like even now, you know, it's it's very difficult trying to balance, you know, um, the residential client, the commercial client. Um, you know, I also work with booking.com and I stage, um, several of, uh, the booking.com, um, like when there are a lot of Airbnbs that, um, are out now and I stage a lot of Airbnbs, uh, for booking.com. And so I have uh, that set design in me, um, and interior design. It's that combination of both. It keeps me so busy. It keeps wow. me so busy. And, but you got to be willing to, you know, seize these opportunities um, and not be afraid to take the risk. Mm -hmm. And that's really what's, what's gotten me um, thus far. It's um, amazing. But, it, but it's not, yeah, but I mean, it's, it's high risk. But, and I even think like, you know, for designers, um, you know, everything is a risk. Like, you know, paying for a publicist is a risk. You don't know what you're going to get out of that. Right. And, you know, public, publicity is not cheap. Like, that can range anywhere from two to six thousand dollars a month. Right. Like I will be very honest and say that what I pay in PR right now is twice as much as I pay in rent. Right. So right, it's right, right. not it's not an easy thing. Well, it's, it's another. Thing, it's, it it's sounds like it's another calculated strategy, another calculated risk on your part. It's almost like when yeah. you would do. A, a room for no design fee in order to get your portfolio beefier. Now you are investing more in PR than you are in the place that you live, but you're doing yeah. it because it's going to bring you to the next level. I, it's, it, you know, and, and, and it's to your point, you said at one point in your conversation a few moments ago that in five years from now, if we talk to you, it will be a different set of risks, a different set of challenges, a different set of things that you needed to be prepared to be lucky for. They might be at a higher level, but it's going to be a repeat of that same process of creating an opportunity, evaluating the risk and the ROI on it, and jumping and leaping towards it or not. And it doesn't matter if it was when you were with absolutely no money and no paid work, or are you going to be at the level that you're at now with brand ambassadorships and TV shows and, you know, everything else. It's your, you just expressed, this is still a risk. Although I'm just going to say it's Andrew Joseph PR. Let's be real. That's not much of a risk. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we well, all Andrew know is, he's got a crack it, team over there, <laughs> yes. but no, I, and I'm joking only to give Andrew the plug because I adore him and his team. And I do know that they do, do a great job. But for you, it's real. You are calculating. And when you say it in terms like that, that you're spending as much or more there than you are in your rent, that that makes it very real to any of us listening that think that it's just easy. Oh, well, I'm Mikhail Welch now and I have a publicist. It's still a calculated business decision on your part. And that is also the theme of everything that you've said is that you not only started out with a degree in business, but it is has been the the thread all the way through that that marketing know how that marketing sense always evaluating things from a strategic standpoint on what if I do this work for free if I do this internship if I, I trail this person if I shadow this person what will it get me as opposed to oh my goodness that's just so amazing because that person's famous and I'll just do this for that person oh it's a famous show house I'll just do it so I love that you have worked so hard and that it's paying off but you have as I said you have worked smart not just hard very cool very cool
Yeah, awesome. So we're definitely going to have to have you back in a couple of years and just see what kind of things you have gone on to create because it's clear that you're not done, that you're still achieving and striving and you're driven and it's a really cool story. And it's funny, I noticed on Instagram a couple of weeks ago that you were in Hawaii and foolishly I thought you were vacationing. <laughs> you no, know, it, it was it was a bifold experience. Um, I was um, working for Inspired Closet for, you know, seven days. And then the last four days, um, I have this thing with my parents where because, you know, they took such good care of me, um, I take them on a trip every year. Oh, so isn't that I, awesome? And, and, you know, we had a great time in, in Honolulu. So nice, nice, a great nice. Time. Very mm-hmm. nice. Yeah. I love it. That's 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 a good kid. I told you your parents raised you well. I knew it. <laughs> I've said that to my kids all along, all along when they were kids growing up. And, it, you know, who needs another dress for another, you know, sweet 16 mm-hmm. party and a, another this and another that. And I go, you know, someday you are going to keep me in a very nice lifestyle. That's all I'm telling yeah. you. <laughs> Exactly. And I'm going to collect, I told them. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Well, Mikkel, it's been an absolute pleasure getting to know you. I, I, I loved you from the moment that we met last spring at Ethan Allen, but it's been really fun getting to know all about your life and the really the – the hard work that you do and the smart work that you do. And I'm so grateful that you shared, like you said, I'm going to tell you the truth because the truth is what helps each of us listening to be able to rate relate it to our own lives and to be able to take a lesson and a nugget and something that you've said and say, huh, maybe that's my chance, my opportunity there, just like Mikkel's. Or if I have to ask a friend for a little bit of help, maybe it's okay because I'm going to make something of that that opportunity and that favor that that friend does for me. So I really do thank you so much for sharing everything and for being real about it. Not a problem. No, I, I hopefully my story will encourage someone else to take that leap. So leap on people. <laughs> leap on people. I love it. Oh, thanks, Mikhail. Bye. Thank you. I think we can pretty much agree that Mikkel is the actual living proof of how staying focused on your goals and getting clear on your why pays off, right? It's so incredible to see how he did all of the work he needed to do in order to get where he is now, making it look like it just happened, right? From starting at Bloomingdale's and the container store and pushing through every obstacle that came along the journey. This conversation of Mikkel shows how important it is to have confidence in yourself, right? And to have the determination to get the job in front of you done. Who would have thought that Mikkel started out by working for free, right? But just as he mentioned, in his mind, it was yet a strategy, right? It's such a clear vision of his goal. And that was a strategy for him to scale the business up. I have to say, taking every opportunity, making the most of it, these things paid off for him big time, right? So I hope you enjoyed hearing this if it was the first time you heard it. I I know that um, the lessons from Mikkel really can apply to all of us at every stage of our business. And thank you. Thank you, Mikkel, for showing up and for sharing that conversation with us back in 2018. I'm so glad. You know, podcasting is great. You just pull it out and do it again, right? I mean, you might have missed it. Who wants to miss that episode, right? Uh, Anyway, I've been loving re-listening to these shows. And I do hope that you are too. I hope that whatever holidays you observe or don't observe, however you come into the end of the year, I hope that you are taking a moment to rest, relax, recharge. Okay? Thank you so much for joining me today. Decide to be excellent. Thank you for joining me today. This podcast is a production of Luann Nigara Inc. If you want to know more about me, my books, or Luann University, go to luannnigara.com. And if you are interested in having Window Works help you with your next window treatment or awning project in the New York, New Jersey metro area, go to windowworksnj.com to learn more. 
Have an excellent day.